Ja, kanske så lite av sajtet. Luka, vad ska man? Cannot come closer with the camera. Wherever you are, that's okay. We all need to vote some right. If you're way in the back, you're not part of the program, you're just gonna stay sad. This is not the temple, this is the generation, so we have to create a All the guys with the yellow shirts, come on up front. <laughs> oh, the translation team is back right there, okay. Where's the other boys? Where's Gopal? He just left. Who's Gopal's brother? Nikolai. Nikolai, Gopal! I would just like to begin by thanking all the devotees. Uh, my reason for this is because I can see that all of you are involved with this program are really enthusiastic. And it's, the results are increasing every day. Today there was 181 books. Which is about 60 books more than yesterday. 30 books more than yesterday. And 30 books more than the day before. So each day it increases more and more. So, and the enthusiasm is good. I'll keep it up. People today, from what I saw, we're very happy to meet the devotees because the devotees are looking happy and enthusiastic. Krishna inspires people to be open and receptive. So, this particular session is designated as questions and answers. And I know nobody will ask a question, so I'll say something until you can think of something to say. I have a question. Okay. The question is no questions now. <laughs> In the Srimad Bhagavatam, you did that, didn't you? Yes, okay. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, second chapter, there's a whole purport where Srila Prabhupada talks about questions and answers. And he says this is the business of the human society. Everyone is asking questions. Politicians are asking questions. People in the marketplaces are asking questions. People are asking questions about this situation, that situation. He goes on and lists a whole list of categories of individuals. And he says, this is life. Someone is asking and someone is answering. But we understand that there's no real progress in this type of activity because it's all based on increasing sense gratification. It is explained that what is the difference between a flea 
Lord, and the end, and Lord Brahma. Well, we, we actually say that their positions are, are quite different, and their responsibilities are usually, usually different. But in one purport, I think it was the purport of today's verse in Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada says, really there's no difference because both are interested in sense gratification. I remember when I was, I went on my own one and only morning walk with Sri Srila Prabhupada. It was in 1975 in New York City, in Washington Square Park. And I could never get close to Prabhupada, but I was there within the group, somewhere near the middle. And Prabhupada stopped. Now, we were walking through Central Park in New York, and Central Park is a huge park. It's one of the biggest parks in the American probably one of the, the, the biggest. And there's cars and roadways that go through the park. So the cars are zooming by, and Prabhupada stopped. And he turned to all of us, and he posed the question. And the question was, the question was, what is the difference between the man who's running on four wheels and the dog who's running on four legs? And then, of course, no one really knew the answer. And Prabhupada says, there's no difference, because the business is the same. The man is running on four wheels, for sense gratification, the dog is running on four legs for sense gratification. The business is the same. So he says in the human form of life, one should not pursue sense gratification as the goal. One should pursue, pursue ultimately self-realization. So part of that understanding of oneself or the process of self-realization means submissive or inquiry. For posing questions that will either help one to understand the process of devotional service, help one to overcome obstacles that may be in the path of our spiritual life, or to understand Krishna, or Krishna in his various manifestations and incarnations. So there's different categories of questions and answers within the spiritual context. So questions and answers should be thought about, and then one should follow, offer a question. If one is thinking seriously about devotional service, there will always be questions. When we read, we think, and when we think, we start to wonder maybe what does this mean or how is this related to something else that i've heard so like that so one of the ways to inspire questions is very attentive hearing because by very attentive hearing the intelligence becomes engaged when the intelligence becomes engaged then naturally or you normally questions will arise so we step, where's our little line of all the young? We have Vitai there, and we have Luke here. Where's where's Gopal? Where did he go? He wants to, he wants to take the shot. Right? Okay, where's where's your other Luke? One Luke is missing, one Gopal also. These guys are the question guys. Huh? Okay. So we'll start, and you can ask your first question to His Holiness Pralatananda Maharaj.
Krishna. I wanted to ask this question yesterday. Dr. Krishna Madhava Maharaj, he mentioned how Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he didn't want to travel on the Kali uh, And if I understood correctly, he put the bag one day prior so that the journey already started. So my question was, uh, if you're traveling for the sake of preaching, how can this be an auspicious feeling if it's on the Kali Shri? It's not for yourself. Well, I've never heard that it's not auspicious to travel on Kadasa. That it was on Thursday that he used to do that. It was because it, on Thursday afternoon there was something called Rabu Kala. Every day there's a Rabu Kala, but for some reason on Thursday that it was noted Rabu Kala, which comes usually in the afternoon. So Shul Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada put his bag in the morning or in that, in that evening he put it outside his door so that the idea was that he was starting his travel on the day before, not on the Thursday. And Prabhupada didn't really think that was very important. I mean, although he generally didn't travel on Thursday either. As far as the Kadasi goes, usually Kadasi is a good day to travel. It's considered an auspicious day to travel. But, as Prabhupada said one time, that as regards to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada's sentiment do, uh, do, before an operation, he wrote something about his will and his will, because he, he wasn't so confident about the outcome of the surgery. So Prabhupada said that everyone has their sentiment. But as far as barely tra taking not traveling on certain times or following the astrological situation and therefore making adjustments accordingly. Prabhupada said, if I had to make adjustments for all the astrological arrangements, I could do any preaching. Therefore, he generally didn't take it so seriously, although sometimes he took note of it. I read, I read in the Vaishnava Ethica, He wrote that the devotee never uh, travels alone. Never travels alone. alone. Okay. Um, there's one statement that talks about what you should do alone, what you should do with two, what you do with three, what you should do with four, what you do with five. So numbers and activities correlated It's like you take Prashadam low. How can you to do that? With two, you can study. Three, uh, Kirtan. Four, travel. So it's precious to travel. Or recommend that travel by four. It's somewhere in whatever. I think it's. it's some Niti Shastra, or some less But, you know, again, if I had to wait for somebody to travel with me, I would never get to travel. Right? So the same thing is, your service is most important when you depend on Krishna. But if you can make something ideal without any extra endeavor, then that's, that's the best. The idea is to, is to utilize, you know, whatever Krishna provides when you do your service. If he doesn't provide, you know, someone to travel with you, and you're responsible for going somewhere, then you have to make the arrangements anyway. So, so these, these, there's things called recommendations, or, or what we say, optimum considerations, which are principles that can support you know, higher devotional activities, but ultimately they're dispensable if they interfere with the higher devotional activity. They have to support it and not take away from it. Yes, Anukula and Pratikula. One is favorable and one is unfavorable. Okay? okay. Uh, I just want to ask you, uh, uh, my parents didn't like uh, 
me to join Hare Krishna movement, how to deal with that? You're really they, are, they are undisturbed, they are disturbed. Did you join them? Uh, sorry? You already joined them. Yeah. They don't know yet. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> Where are your parents live? Uh, near me. <coughs> near, we are uh, close, near, maybe five meters. <laughs> <laughs> neighbors. Neighbors. Yeah, neighbors. And they don't know you're going here. They, uh, they know. I'm the wrong person. I mean, uh, they know that so I'm the wrong person. So when they say, don't join the Hare Krishna movement, you say yes, yes, yes. So you just say yes, yes, yes. you're right. I'll never join the Hare Krishna movement. You keep doing that because they keep saying Hare Krishna all the time. Chanting Hare Krishna. Yeah. And then it's no joy. So it's enough to chant it. Question. Okay. If you don't give a question, we'll call on you. And I'm the man to go to the to go to the ocean 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 to go what happens? 21 generations of Kshatriya kings. Yeah. That means descent. When one generation was killed, you killed another generation, another generation, another generation. Generation means, you know, there's the, the king, and then he has his son, and that's the next generation. But if you kill generation, how many generations will be produced? Mm -hmm. He waited until they grew up and then when they had sons and they killed them all. <laughs> that answer is as ridiculous as the question. You can go back in time and find out. It's nice, 21 generations of Shashri. So it may not be the, the descendants, but the, those, you know, one generation, another generation, another generation. He hated, he, he thought all the Shashriyas were unqualified to be Shashriyas. They were simply in name only. And that's why he did it. They were taking the position. And he also had a, 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 a kind of like an enmity against Kshatriyas because of one Kshatriya came to stop him. Which Yuga? It's mentioned that after the 21 generations of Kshatriya kings were killed, there was no Kshatriyas to rule the earth. And then, whatever royalty was left, this is in the Mahabharata, the ladies, or the princesses, were designated to have union with sages to produce a class of Kshatriyas, which were rejoicers. So after Parasuram did his business, this was the, the problem to again re-establish Shetri rule, but same rule. So the sages were consulted and agreed for this austerity to have union with these princes in order to produce. And then the earth became Krishna conscious. But then when the earth became Krishna conscious, what happened was a fight broke out in the, he in the heavenly planets between the devils and the demons. And the, the demons were looking for a base to fight the Davis, so they chose Earth, and they entered into different species of life and ultimately destroyed quality of life on Earth. 
And then that's where Srimad Bhagavatam begins. When Krishna says when the, when the earth was overthrown over Kshatriya forces, that was due to those demons taking birth in different species. And then Krishna was asked to descend at that point. So that happened. That, that killing of the Kshatriya kings happened before Krishna came down. Apparently it was in Shreta Yuga, the first Rama. He was Kartavir Arjuna. He had fought against Ravana. And Ravana appeared in Shreta Yuga. So apparently it's in Shreta Yuga that he was. Yeah. He still exists. He's supposed to become one of the seven sages. So the next uh, when Indra did, when, our, when there's a new Indra then there'll be a new set of seven sages Parashurama will become one of those sages he's waiting the Sakharishis that have their seven their planet that circle the post star there's seven people I forgot all of them but seven people who are still here during the time when Krishna is on the planet one is Parasurama, even before that, before Krishna. And another one is Vyasadeva, Kripachari. Aspitama, of course, he's not in a very good state. He's, uh, he's finished? Okay. Lucky. <laughs> and uh, Anuman? He's not one of the ones that's mentioned. Bali. But there's a whole list of seven. Bali is going to become the next Indra. Bali becomes the next Indra. Good. Do you know what it says? Yeah. Mother Chandrika. Um, in, in Shastras, it is said that the nature of the soul is such ananda, and uh, I wonder when it, um, the knowledge which we have as a soul, when it is revealed, this full knowledge, because I also heard that when you are coming to the spiritual world, you are also going through some training, to do the service, so this whole knowledge, when it come, comes up, maybe in this material world, body or in a spiritual world, but still we need to go through the training. Full knowledge means we know Krishna. It's not that we know everything. We know full knowledge means that when we come to complete consciousness, then we have clear consciousness. We see everything as it is. According to our, where, wherever we are, we see things clearly. As far as full knowledge, we never have full knowledge in the sense that we have knowledge like Krishna. Our knowledge is always limited, but it, it's much more than it is now. But it's pure. And when we get back to serve Krishna in the spiritual world, you have to know what to do. Therefore, we have to go through some training. And even when we get back to the spiritual world, it's not the end. We're always learning something new all the time here. It's not that we sit around thinking, well, I know everything here. I'm the old no one sage. No, we learn every moment. Everyone's learning something new there. There's always something new and marvelous that, that we're realizing. Even Krishna is realizing new things all the time. Otherwise, it would be quite boring. What should a devotee do to get enthusiasm back? When, when you lose your enthusiasm, how to get it back? Well, I, I know what I do, but you can do many things. Um, I just check, jump, and then I get it. It again, it returns. I mean, sometimes prolonged chanting, but check. Sometimes we read, 
and that will inspire us in our enthusiasm. But I think the one recommended way that's mentioned in the Shastra is to associate with people who are enthusiastic. And then you start feeling enthusiastic also. Association is very powerful. So it's not like you become enthusiastic by playing basketball. <laughs> Which we just did. <laughs> But, you know, that's not part of the Shubhad Bhagavatam's recommendation for enthusiasm. There was a group of Goswamis. So, enthusiasm, Utsahan, means to, you know, endeavor in the right way. That's enthusiasm. But to get inspired, I guess that's what you mean, how to get inspired in our Krishna consciousness. You know, associate with senior devotees and get inspired by their association. That's the best one. Is that all right? Hare Krishna. Okay. The Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, I give the intelligence by which you will come back to me. And sometimes we see that uh, we make a mistake. So it means that we, we didn't receive full knowledge or Although we had knowledge, we had the knowledge, we are prone to to commit mistake. I don't quite understand. So for Krishna, he says he gives the knowledge to those who are constantly devoted and who worship me with love. I give them the understanding by which they can come to me. So as much as we are steady in our service, and as much as we are enthusiastic, and Krishna reciprocates by giving us intelligence in such a way as to further increase our enthusiasm and further increase our steadiness in pure devotional service. When we really a mistake means that we're doing something which will not help our enthusiasm and help our steadiness in devotional service. That's the real mistake. So that means instead of listening to Krishna, we're listening to our materialistic mind and senses are dictating to us. So the way of overcoming that is simply listen to Krishna. Shanai, Shanara, Paramet, Buddha, Drita, Grihitaya, Atma, Samstamana, Kritva, Nakim, Shedapi, Chintaya. That's by one should control his mind by conviction, by steady intelligence sustained by conviction, and that's one should think of the self alone and should think of nothing else. Wherever the mind wanders to, due to its flickering and unsteady nature, one must withdraw it and bring it back under the control of the self. The yogi who has fixed his mind upon me verily attains the highest perfection state of happiness. By virtue of his identity with Brahman, he is liberated, his passions are quieted, and he is free from all his sins. So we just have to put our mind back in Krishna. Then Krishna will tell us how to keep our mind on Krishna. What's the day of Sometimes, uh, even if we think that we are forgive to some people, forgive, yes, sir. Yeah, but it's uh, uh, someone's forgiving you. You're forgiving them. I mean, I, I think that I forgive them, but I have, I keep, I have this feelings inside still that. So <laughs> you want to forgive, you yes. forgive, but still it's yes. not complete. I think that I forgive, but when I think about something, I get emotional back. Yeah, that means there, in order to, you know, smooth over a situation, you might forgive, but in your heart, you're really not forgiving. Um, if someone, you wouldn't forgive anybody if they're insincere in the way they did something. 
You mean that if someone apologizes to you or doesn't apologize? You mean you just forgive without apologies? <laughs> I don't know, both. Sometimes it the apologize. One of the qualities of the vice one is forgiveness. One of the main qualities. The devotee makes, takes no offense for themselves, but they may feel offended if someone offends another Vaishnava or someone offends the one. <laughs> like that. And then, <coughs> for oneself, if you, if you feel offended, that means what are you defending? You don't see them. So, how to forgive is that you should think. I've done so many things to so many other people and somehow they, I want them to forgive me. So I should also be forgiving to others. And if you're not able to forgive others, you can't expect others to forgive you also. So whatever we want to others to be towards us, we also have to be that towards them. It can't be one way. And here's another part, just like I was in London um, two years ago, I think it was maybe, maybe last year, two years ago. There was a large group of people came from Birmingham and they were, we had a little talk on Vaishnava relationship and at the end one lady came up to me and she said, you know Maharaj, I'm holding this grudge against this one person for 25 years and I don't know what to do because we were talking about that in class. I said, well, she said, it's killing me. I said, yeah. The person who it's directed towards is not as suffering as much as you, probably not maybe that you might even suffering at all. It's the other carrying that weight around. So you have somehow you have to, you have to let it go. So when we really understand that we also do things that are that need to be forgiven, we should also forgive others. When Christ was asked, how many times should we forgive, forgive somebody? Seven times? The person asked the question, he said seven times. He said seven times seventy. That was his answer. It means seven times seventy means that there's no limit. There's no limit how, how much of a Vaishnava can be forgiven. Aridas Thakur was being beaten in 22 marketplaces, yet and there was no animosity, there was no, what we say, revenge in his mind. He was only thinking of the welfare of those, those people. So, we may, once you, once you come to the point of understanding that it's for your benefit to forgive, and people make mistakes. People make mistakes, so you can expect that to happen. So just be tolerant and be forgiving. And sometimes you may also speak to the person and get a clearer understanding in a very, what we say, caring way to be sensitive to the issue and not to make it more explosive in order to understand things more clearly so you can move on in life. But sometimes these things are not possible, so you just forgive. It's hard. There's no question it's hard. The closer someone is to you, when they do something wrong, the more it hurts the heart. If an enemy does something, it's mentioned in the Bhagavatam. If an enemy does something to you, you know, you might get a little angry, but after a while it just goes. Or someone who's not so close to you. But someone who's close to you when they do something, but somehow we have to go on in there. Okay? Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, Krishna Bhakti is a mention of Krishna. Krishna, when is it? Krishna, 
Krishna Garu. Um, Krishna, he, when Drona and Dara underwent austerities to have Krishna as their child, then Krishna appeared before them and agreed that he appeared before them in three different incarnations. And one of them was was Krishna Garva and who was the yeah, and then they had an incarnation, Krishna of, of Vishnu, who appeared before Dhruva Maharaj, so that their son, Vishnu, was the one who appeared before Dhruva Maharaj and gave him, gave him the benediction of the planet of Dhruva Loka. <coughs> Okay, you satisfied? Yes, it's up to your mind. Is there some evidence in the scriptures that uh, we should or we can address Vaishnavis as Prabhupada or Prabhu? Uh, is there some evidence? Or some other Praman, yes. That Pramach we address the Vaishnav as Prabhu? Vaishnavis. Vaishnavis, we are very good to trust him as mother. We are just as mother. And when Prabhupada, sometimes he would refer to the women as ladies. He would say, the ladies, please, sit over here. He would generally, when he talked, generally he said ladies, but when he talked to them individually, he said, we should talk, we should dress women as mother, except for one's wife. Uh, but I don't know. If you say Vaishnavis, it's not wrong. But it's something that's more or less entered into our society as some etiquette that's come by way of understanding that there's Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. But Prabhupada never used that term. He used mother, ladies, in gen as a general term, like that. He said, men should dress all women as mother. That includes your god sisters and members of the Islam society. That's the proper etiquette. Uh, I found the proper. Maybe I'm not And uh, ladies between themselves, they also call them mother? How they call each other? Ladies and children. <laughs> I think they can call each other by name. Mm -hmm. right? I don't know. Talk around these or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. That, you can ask them. Let's see if they can do that. I, don't, I never heard Carl answer that question. I don't know if that question is ever. How ladies should address each other. I think, I've also, when I've been in India, I've heard ladies address other ladies as Mataji, or mother. When you address a lady as Mataji in India, that's a really respectful term. Here, we just kind of use it loosely, but actually, when you, if you, you're actually giving an honor to a lady when you, when you refer to her as mother. <coughs> she's, she feels like she's being respected. So I've seen ladies address each other as mother also, or mother she thinks they're not the two. In my experience. The word Prabhu, Prabhupada well, said we should use that amongst men. But Prabhupada gave us that understanding. following authority uh, and at the same time we are encouraged not to blindly follow and also think with our own hands. Uh, 
So now I'm wondering, for example, if we have authority that we don't agree with on something, uh, where is the room to address this and how to do it properly? Because that's quite a general question. Because there's so many possibilities of... But, even Krishna, when he was speaking to Arjuna, he said, he said that, uh, iti te jyam akyatam guyam guyatma maya vishrim shaitara sheshena itai chasi tata karu. Now I'm explaining to you fully about this knowledge. Now consider it very carefully and then do what you wish to do. Prabhupada states in the purport that after hearing this knowledge, we should deliberate it on it, and use our intelligence to the fullest we can, and then decide what to do. So it's not that we shouldn't use our intelligence, we should use our intelligence. As far as in a disagreement with the authority, well, the question is why we disagree with, or with the authority. Is it because he's the authority and we disagree? <laughs> or because they have a different point of view and we don't accept it? because we feel that there's a better point of view. So of course, we can discuss it with our authority, hopefully, and try to reach a, a mutual agreement. The Vaishnavas are expert in compromise and agreement. <coughs> That's why they get along with each other. Because in this world, everyone's an individual, and everyone has their individual perspectives and sentiments and feelings about everything. So unless the Vaishnavas learn how to cooperate by by compromising, then things would go, it, it, we couldn't actually be very effective in our service and effective in our spreading our Krishna consciousness. So therefore, we try to compromise as best we can. And of course, our authority is adamant, and there's no possibility of compromising. We don't want to compromise. Probably to set up a system where we have higher authority than our authority. He said that it was something like in the traditional system, if you, your verdict you don't agree with, the lower court judge, then so you go to the higher judge and you try to get a favorable verdict from a higher court. So there's a system of hierarchy also, authority in our society, and you can go all the way up to the GBC body and try to get your whatever you feel is you don't agree with your authority, try to have to rectify it up to the GBC body. Or if you know that the GBC representative or your temple president or something. Other than that, we chant Hare Krishna, we smile, we say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there has to be authority, or else the whole society will break down. There's no, if there, everybody's an individual authority, then how can we organize everything? How can we do anything? The whole thing is work it works on authority, leadership, and hierarchy. But there's a system, if there's some, as Maharaj explained, you know, some difficulty or some disagreement, but they, one has to ultimately stay within the system. Well, it's not only a system, but it's the very basis of our spiritual advancement, is to accept some authority and serve the higher authority. That, that is how we, ultimately, our authorities are supposed to be connected with their authority, and the authority is supposed to go all of that way back to Krishna. So by serving our authorities, we're supposed to be actually serving not only them, but the Parampara and Krishna himself. Therefore, if we want to make spiritual advancement, we have to serve authority. Otherwise, there's no question. As soon as we think we're the authority, and then I have no authority to serve, probably writes in the Chaitanya Chaitanya that one is at once fallen. Therefore, we have to have some authority that we're serving. And that authority has to be connected with Krishna's line of authorities. Uh, Mother Haruni, you can understand? English good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hare Krishna, I have a question regarding the actually five principal rasas and 
how are they manifesting the Loka Vrindavan, especially the uh, Dasarasa, uh, since the, the um, mood in Goloka is like sweet, uh, how is that Rasa manifested in Goloka? I, I mean, uh, which person represents that in Goloka? Well, it says there's, you know, there's, you know, Sakya Ras, there's two aspects of Sakya Ras, and then there's parental affection, and then there's Madhuri Ras. These are the main Rasas, but it says that the trees and the rocks, they're all, you know, there's no Shanta Ras. And there's no Shanta Ras in Vrindavan. Everyone is serving, everyone is sentient. Shaka means no service. No. It mentions that it starts with Dasirat and then you go local with Dalai. Everyone. There's no. Shaka is only in, in Vaikuntha. Shaka means admiration, really. Or actually, even the Maya bodies engage in Shaka Ras. So it's even a Maya body Ras. Nectar instruction, okay. probably, nectar instruction probably starts with Shantaras and says that the cows were dabbing and classified as Shantaras. I can show you verses that say it starts with dash. <laughs> <laughs> but Dasya, uh, it's mentioned that, you know, the, apparently, of course, there's nothing not moving in Vrindavan. Because everything is sentient, everything is spiritual. Even the trees, the plants, the rocks, the water, the atmosphere, everything is, is personal. Everything is, has characteristics, qualities, personality, and consciousness. It's not like in this world, the consciousness depends on the body. But in the spiritual world, everyone has full Krishna consciousness. Even these, what we apparently non moving living beings, but they're pure devotees, as far as the real life. So they may serve the Lord in that, in that way, as Dasya does, by providing nice leaves that Krishna can lay down um, for nice flowers, for Radharani, or just can pick a flower and offer to Krishna, so that flower is serving in that way. I think that's the last question. Dasaras in the spiritual world that's explained in Hector's devotion is devotees like Kathrika and others who are personally gave Krishna's service. And there's a whole different divisions of them. So Dasaras is just as sweet as the other Rasas, but they're just not manifesting the full realm of spiritual sentiments that you find in the other Rasas. But even Balaram, for instance, he's partially in Sakya Rasa, partially in Karendra Rasa. And other devotees, like for instance, Uddhava, partially in friendship and partially has a service out of it. So there are mixtures of all kinds of Rasas in the spiritual world, even in the local Vrindavan. How can we know, uh, or could you explain the characteristic of a person who would change the pure name? Uh, because uh, we, nowadays we have many nice singers, nice bhajans, ketanias, but we don't know what is the background uh, of his motivation, or, or his purity, or this thing for living character. Yeah, we did know because we have many cities and many uh, in our society, many but uh, many leaders here who chant uh, Kirtan and so on. Okay, Siddhartha Saraswati says the qualification for one to lead Kirtan is Trinata Peace and Vichena, Tayori Vasavishnita. That's the only qualification. It's not good boys. Or musical expertise. 
That's the qualification. One who is humble and is trying to glorify the Lord. That quali that's, the quali that's the only qualification for leading. Everything else is a disqualification. If you want to, of course, if you want to inspire others in glorifying the Lord, that's also part of that. But the mood is, is that one has to, you know, be free from any personal motivations when you're leading, because they don't come out in the kirtan. Your consciousness comes in your words, and it's picked up too. Therefore, it's not musical expertise that makes one a kirtan leader, but it's devotion. Uh, maybe you have some experience, which, you know, by name, which, uh, if, you, if, you, if you can mention, which, uh, is, uh, to say, which, which you recommend that we hear uh, bhajans from... Prabhupada. Yes, this is law, and that is except Prabhupada, you know, from Prabhupada, this is... Uh, that you have to that you have to determine for yourself. Yeah, but I have to be wrong. Well you just choose one and let you know if you're right. <laughs> <laughs> After no, no. We don't want to name names in this it's not that's not our program. No, but about characteristic that we can recognize ourselves. You know it. That's the only qualification. One has to be humble or else. If you're not humble, then you're a saint, and as Bhakti Siddhanta says, to attract the ladies, that's all. And then the chanting, you're going to try to sing, so all the ladies will think, oh, what a nice singer he is. And he's thinking, oh, they're all thinking of a nice singer. And that's what you have your fallen. And Krishna's not there. It's not a, it's not a musical expertise that, that attracts Krishna either. He's got many people in the spiritual world, many beings who, who can sing much better than us. <laughs> the Gopis are the best musicians. They sing beautiful and they're expert in all, you know, all arts of music and dance. So it's Trinadopi Sanichi Na, Bhakti Siddhanta gave that. He gave it. Of course, Sri Prabhupada didn't want someone to lead who really couldn't sing properly. Or didn't follow the etiquette for singing. Like during Mangal Arti, if, if the person wouldn't sing the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra enough, Prabhupada wouldn't let that person sing and stop it. He wanted, he wanted Mangal Arti mostly the Hare Krishna Mantra. He, Prabhupada set a standard for how we should lead also. Certain mantras should be chanted, certain mantras should be maybe chanted once or twice or avoided in certain kirtans. So Prabhupada's uh, guidelines for kirtan should be ours also. Because that's a really controversial subject and there's a book, I think Parasaram Prabhu from your Yatra here, he worked on this book with some of the other ladies, some other devotees, um, on setting Iskand Kirtan standards. And it's being, what we say, edited and going back over and over again. Because we've got a pretty wide range of things that happen within our movement right now. So as far as the individual, one who's qualified to lead, they have to be in the mood of glorifying the Lord. Otherwise, no one will be inspired by that kind of character. For some people, it will be. But that, it, may, it may make the mind move a little bit, but it doesn't move the heart. It has to move the heart. That's true. It? it doesn't move your heart, then. That's not true. That's just my secret. <laughs> okay? That's fine. What we say, understand. No questions. We have Matura Pati in the back there. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, in, in the spiritual world,
drugi strani bo pa je tudi, pa tudi slišimo, da je zelo žaljivo sploh misliti, da se lahko presada kontaminira. Kako je s tem? Zanimajo tudi, od kje, uh, uh, kje, kje so informacije, kje si bi dobili informacije o tem? Mislim, od kje vam je odgovor? Well, we're shouting that we become contaminated. It's our consciousness that becomes contaminated. So, probably when I was asked that question, for instance, at the beginning of the body, you say, you used to think, well, Prashadam can never be contaminated. Therefore, if someone has spilled the milk on the floor, the bodies would get down with their tongue and lap it up. <laughs> or, I remember when I first joined, since Prashadam couldn't be contaminated, after the Sunday feast, that the temple president had us eat the remnants, of the, they gather up all the remnants of the karmas from the, the prasadam that they didn't eat on the plate, that would be our breakfast the next day. Because <laughs> <laughs> it could never be contaminated. So when they asked Prabhupada about that, he said, yes, yeah, Prabhupada, prasadam can't be contaminated, but the way it's, it's partly due to your consciousness. If you actually have full faith, then it's not going to affect you. Pallad Maharaj, when he was fed poison, he wasn't affecting him at all because he was fully Krishna conscious. If we ate that same poison, even we offered a provision, we'd probably at least get a stomachache. So it's according to our consciousness. But we can't be artificial and pretend that actually we have full faith in Prashadam because that that depends upon actual purity and realization. Therefore, Prabhupada always asked about that. He said, you should use your discrimination. As long as we have discrimination, we should use it. As we become more advanced, then our discrimination will change up to the point that we'll actually have full faith and it won't bother. Prashana will be honored just like there was one devotee, Kali Krishna does. For him, he had full faith and all the remnant three things, the dust of the lotus feet of the Vaishnavas, the water that washed their feet, and the remnants of Prashadam. And therefore for him, there was no hesitation at all to take Prashadam from any of the Vaishnavas in, in Brandal. And therefore Chaitanya Mahaprabhu honored him. But for he was an advanced Mahabhava devotee. But if we imitate him, then we might get ourselves into trouble. So we have to see but where our real faith lies, how much we're actually developed, and then if we have discrimination, utilize it properly. So we're actually honoring Krishna's prasadam. But of course, just like when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu offered prasadam to Saurabhava Bhattacharya, and Saurabhava Bhattacharya had just got up from his sleeping, he recited two prayers, we already said that prasadam could be honored at any time and any place and should be taken immediately because it's stale or brought from a distant place. When he took prasadam, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was so pleased that he embraced him and said that now he's become a, a devotee of Krishna, a great devotee, because he's honored the Lord's prasadam. He has full faith in prasadam of the Lord. So we can have faith in prasadam of the Lord, but as far as it's becoming sometimes contaminated, you know, by becoming touched by other people. Well, if someone, for instance, the, the plates, the remnants of the plates left over by people who attended our Sunday feeds, if we're not so enthusiastic to take their remnants, that would probably be more normal than pretend that actually we're Mahabhagas and we see everyone as great devotees of Krishna, and therefore we, we feel honored to take their remnants and their saliva when it's mixed with the prasadam because it makes it even more relevant. <laughs> no, we should be, be, be pretentious either. Question for Paul. Okay. No, it's about connected to those services. In our society we had uh, a case when one of uh, Shafaq's disciples changed 
when he was, yeah, he changed his uh, ashram from sannyas to vanaprastha. And also, he said, I don't know if it is true, you can maybe answer also this one, that one of senior sannyasis also like changed his ashram to retired sannyasi. Retired? Retired, yes. Uh, you have some scriptural injunctions about it. Changing from Rana pra, from Sanyasa yeah. to Rana Prasta. Yeah. Scriptural injunctions? Well, I mean, there's many scriptural injunctions. But Prabhupada didn't. Well, first of all, our, our emphasis is not so much on Rana and Ashram. Our emphasis is upon pure devotional service. So, although it's certainly not recommended to go from Sanyasa to Rana Prasta and then Trihasta and then Sanyasa and then whatever. Usually to go from Sanyasa to Trihasta is going down. Yeah, to I mean, Rana Prasta, oh, anyhow. It's not generally, obviously it's not recommended, but probably is the example of Gajendra in one purport. Gajendra was fighting against Maya, well, fighting against the crocodile in the ocean. And because of that, gravity he became weaker and weaker and weaker until he lost all his strength and enthusiasm. So he said that we should fight the crocodile of Maya in a, in our, in a suitable environment. So times, sometimes it's found that someone accepts the role of sannyasi within our society, but later it's found that actually due to it, he's not actually suitable for that particular ashram. So rather than, than leave Krishna consciousness, that one should find a suitable ashram, where one's material desires can be satisfied, but one can continue to fight the, the crocodile of Maya, so that eventually the real success of life will be achieved by our becoming Krishna conscious. <coughs> so everyone should fight Maya in their suitable position, in a suitable position. On the other hand, it should not be that, well, they can just change ashrams whimsically and claim that this is more suitable for me because that's very dangerous. Everyone should try and follow his own path, his duty. Otherwise, to follow someone else's duty could be very dangerous. So we find that most sannyasis who left sannyas have had a very difficult time coming back to Krishna consciousness. Although sometimes some of them have and have become successful in carrying out the mission of Krishna consciousness. But the point Maharaj made should be done basically. In other words, you would, you would need the approval and blessings of the authority, your authority, to do that. I mean, there was one who, one sannyasi who did, you know, fall down. And Prabhupada invited him to come back, be a nice green hospital, and just go on with your service. Many of them. Yeah, many. Yes, I don't understand why Varna Prasta not Grihasta. What kind of material well, because some may have had there. difficulty and may have been an embarrassment, but he's not really interested in Grihasta life. Therefore, he rather than going artificially into Grihasta life, he just decided to relinquish the position. Because Sanyasa is a very respectable position. So, therefore, out of humility, what they take, take it or out of to show humility when they take a lower position. But it's not recommended to do that. Who is it? There was some Sanyasi who retired? I, I don't know. No, I never heard that. Satsuru Maharaj. He's not really, really retired, he's preaching. He's preaching? He preaches regularly. But his health is such that he can't really travel very much, but sometimes he travels. He's 74 years old. <laughs> he's not like spring chicken. You know, he's, but he's still preaching. I, mean, I was with him two years ago. He was in New York when we were on a program together. He's not retired. And you go on his website, and he's always talking about Japa and his realization of Japa. He's still writing. He still writes. So, it's there's no such thing as retiring sannyas. <laughs> yeah, it should not be. One may take a lesser active role 
due to maybe material considerations, but one still has to follow the rules of the rational I mean, the only, there is a retirement, but that's called Babaji. Babaji gave Babaji to one devotee. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Tell the whole story. Well, I mean, probably my point is he gave Babaji to one devotee because I knew the devotee at Alami. He was a friend of mine. He was on, we sometimes traveled together and did book distribution. He went to a doctor. And the doctor proclaimed that he was going to die one year from a heart problem. So he went to Prabhupada and said, As told Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I'm going to leave my body in a year. Can you give me Babaji? So Prabhupada said, All right. So he gave Babaji, he told him to chant 64 hours a day and live in, well, you know, be tired and live in my Don't preach. So he did that for some time. He got a little bored after some time. And he went to Prabhupada and said, Prabhupada, I can't do it. So Prabhupada said, all right, then I'll give you, then he didn't act as a sannyasi. So then he went back to the doctor, and the doctor said, oh, I made a mistake, because after a year he didn't die, so he was wondering what happened. So he went back to the doctor, and the doctor said, oh, I made a mistake, you're not going to die. <laughs> so they said, I'm not going to die, and he went, so he, then he went back with his girlfriend. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to die, I'm going to go back with my girlfriend. Yeah, I didn't find that What's that? He died in a different way. <laughs> no, the point, the point was Prabhupada, after he did that, he said, no more. No, no more of this. He was really disgusted with it. He was very disgusted. Because in, in good faith, Prabhupada did his best to encourage that person. But then, you know, many times when Prabhupada saw he went out of his way to facilitate something and then someone didn't live up to their end. And then he became unhappy. Same with marriages. Prabhupada was marrying devotees because there was no one else to do at the very beginning of the movement. And after three years he stopped. He said, because the boys are not taking the marriage vow seriously. So he stopped doing the marriages. And of course they went on, but not by the Prabhupada. But he, he expressed his dissatisfaction about the way we used to accept vows and then, then somehow or other change. If you make a vow, I mean, if you make a promise, there's consideration. But when you make a vow, vow means no change. When we take our vows, I mean, it's better, Papa said, better to die than break your vows. What he's saying, that's how serious it is when you make a vow. It's just stick to it. Despite all the circumstances that may come. But, there, you know, with the blessings of the Acharyas, maybe things can be adjusted. Serious. Krishna consciousness is serious. You should be very serious when you do things. Next question? Oh, I have three minutes. Uh, yes, we're both. <laughs> Then they can make it. Uh, if, 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 
that means then that if you don't have this consciousness, you shouldn't need, uh, need to care about it. She's trying to get the consciousness. <laughs> Is it that hard? You pray. My dear Lord, I can't sing. I can't do anything. But here I'm asked to do this service, so by your mercy, you know, um, give me the give me the power to glorify you nicely. We pray. We pray for the qualities that we want in order to execute the service. We don't depend on our own abilities. So one who's actually praying, that's also the quality of Trinata P, because they're depending on the mercy of the Lord, not on their musical expertise and ability to know writers or whatever, you know, nice voice. You're singing to glorify the Lord, that's what I have to remember. And we're also singing to inspire the, the other devotees to glorify the Lord. It's like Prahlad Maharaj or others. 
but how many of us are actually purely chanting the holy name and in our effort to do sadhana consistently and in a pure state of consciousness, then we have to make arrangements in this material world to facilitate that, to make it easier. So therefore we have to, we want a clean place, we want to have some, you know, nice push up, proper pushadam, proper covering, proper regulated activities. These will all help us chant nicely. So simply, things like Joe teach, they can be utilized if they're utilized in order to actually help in things like, for instance, in the Madhavas, and also in our movement, we utilize it to assess sannyas candidates before they, before they become sannyas candidates. Because many times people think I'm very renounced, and then in a few years they're probably going to want to get married. And then it's, if they take sannyas prematurely, and then become too much disturbed by desires to get married, it may make their life very miserable with emotional service. So it should be properly done, not whimsically. And devotional service is certainly is the consideration. It's, just, it's part of our it's called gona bhakti. Gona bhakti. Subsidiary activities that can facilitate devotional service. So for those who are not pure devotees, Mahabhagwa, sometimes these things are helpful to progress our devotional service. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Next question. 
Yeah, you're thinking, that's very nice. Why are you so concerned about your relatives? Your relatives are concerned that you don't. Are they concerned what your pros, what, where your next destination is? Do they generally. It's nice that your relatives are concerned. I'm sure they're well wishers. Unfortunately, they're probably in ignorance of what actually your well, what your benefit really is. Therefore, to take consideration of what their desires are, even if they're well wishers, but if they're in ignorance and they don't actually know what's beneficial and what's not beneficial, then you can say yes, yes, but then do what's actually beneficial for yourself. You should follow real authorities. Rather than becoming a follower of someone who's blind, if you do that, then both of you, both the person who's leading you and you yourself, will get into trouble. Yesterday, was it? Someone asked the question. Rather than Maharaj answered. Uh, to, someone asked Prabhupada a question, when, when is a person no longer your disciple? If they, if they break the principles, Prabhupada, illicit sex, Prabhupada said, no. Intoxication, no. He said, but meat eating, once they go back to meat eating, again, they're really falling. Very falling. It's really a it's really has a lot of bad karma connected to it. I should not. I should not. What is considered in everyone is considered to be capable of appreciating the glories of Krishna, except for one who's killing animals or killing oneself. This is the introductory verse of the tenth canto of Shrimad Bhagavatam. Besides that, according to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, if you kill a cow, then you're going to have, or if you're involved in it, you're going to have to spend 10,000 years of hell for every hair on the cow. And since nowadays they make cows with more hair, it's going to be a long time. Point is, if you're in knowledge and you know what's wrong, and you still do it, 
It's worse than doing something wrong and not knowing it. So, best to move yourself out of that. If you want to learn how to cook, just fail that course, that's all. <laughs> that particular course, you just have to fail. I failed most of my school. And you still look good cook. <laughs> <laughs> Some people may think that, not everybody. <laughs> the brahmacharis don't think so. The story of the peanuts, you know that story? I was a cook in the brahmachari ashram, over and down in farm. So we had, the part of the breakfast was dried oats, and this government surplus oats. Just so they gave me a frying pan. The frying pan was about a meter long. The handle was a meter long, and the pan also was a meter almost a, it was about a half a meter long. And then it had a little dents in it. And so I had a dry toast to oats, and I was giving it to the devotees, and they were saying, this is really terrible. So I had some peanuts. So they said, all right, let's put peanuts in it. So, my philosophy was that peanuts means protein, and protein <laughs> means increased sex desire. <laughs> Too much protein makes you really quite, you know, active in that category. So I figured, okay, I counted the devotees and I multiplied each devotee and multiplied the peanuts by eight. So each devotee could get eight peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> that was serious. And then there was a revolution, and I couldn't, you know, withstand the revolution, so I increased it to 13 pounds. <laughs> they all fell down. They all fell down. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't eat any peanuts, so I'm okay. This was not me. But that was, you know, so when it comes to Prashada, you know, we should follow the standard. Stay away from this contaminated thing. Because what Maharaj was pointing out is that why is it so bad? And he quoted that verse from Because the first and foundational principle of spiritual life is kindness and compassion to other living beings. And that really flies in the face of that injunction when you, when you willingly accept, you know, taking part in violence. That's the first principle, to be kind to all the things. Bukunda, you had a statement or a question? <laughs> Mitch, you can sit up here. <laughs> It's a solution to the, okay, the Lucas situation because Kriyapala Prabhu was in the same situation years back and he was also learning to be a cook. So technically you can do everything theoretically. So you can theoretically not do cut meat, but you don't do it. You don't have to do it practically in your course and still pass the course. And it, in a, this way you avoid the meat and still in the Yes, but Imagine you go to practice to Govindas. Yes. Yeah. Or somewhere else that's vegetarian. If you can. Okay. Yeah. 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 This is a serious question. He can do that in fashion to a theoretical. If you have a link with such a bar with stick on the Objection of consciousness. Objection of consciousness. Can we have a volunteer for someone to practically help him in this situation? Is there some devotee that would actually Work with him and help him in this. 
This is a serious thing because his whole life would depend on us. Anyone who would like to help him? Okay. So she can you know, other gender none of the home. Okay. Another question? I just replied. I mean, uh, my yeah. uh, understanding was that Sri Prabhupada's uh, sister, she was cooking meat for her, her husband. And the pure devotee, like uh, Sri Prabhupada's father was a pure devotee and he married her to yeah. that person. We talked about that yesterday. Yeah. So what does that mean? I don't have a conclusion. I don't have it. Doesn't doesn't fit into what we're discussing anymore. No. Because she was trying to save her husband. She went to Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, "Stay with him." And she changed it by simply by serving him nicely and giving him also Krishna consciousness.